Uh, are we on? No. Hold on. I'll start again. Excellent. That's all right. So, uh, yes, welcome in the name of the Father, the Son, and uh, the Holy Spirit to Mount Zion this morning. It's good to see everyone here. Um, you're very welcome, especially if you are visiting today. And um, I hope that uh, the road disruptions were, were not too difficult to maneuver around. Uh, uh, Andrew sent out a nice little map for those of us uh, who were uh, trying to come this morning. Uh, and so that's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, as usual, the service is being shown live on our YouTube channel. So uh, it's uh, hello and welcome to all. Uh, wherever you're watching and whenever you're watching. Um, you know, there's quite a lot of people who view this service uh, during the course of the week, the month, and in the weeks ahead. Um, and in fact, um, by the end of this week, probably another 60 people will have watched this service live on the YouTube, cha YouTube channel. In a few months' time, that number will be up to over 200. So that's a, an incredible... Uh, 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 spread of, of, of the service of the worship here at Mount Zion around, probably around the world. So we, we give thanks for that. This morning, um, you'll notice that we are, we are a short of a few men. Um, <laughs> we're not, we're not, you're not short men, we're just short of a few men. Uh, uh, because a group are enjoying a men's weekend retreat in Pembrokeshire. Um, and uh, I hear that already there's talk of possibly organizing a women's retreat at some stage. So that'll be, uh, that'll be, that'll be very interesting to see how that works out. Um, however, this morning we are very pleased that we're able to, to welcome uh, our own David Stevenson, who for the first time is bringing us uh, uh, the word today. There we are. Great. I, you know, we know it's a, it's a big thing to ask uh, to ask anyone to prepare a message um, and then to stand up in front of a congregation and deliver it, even when it's full of smiling and welcome face, welcoming faces as it is this morning. So you're very welcome, Dave, and thank you. We're very grateful that you have accepted the call to preach this morning. We know that you will have the, the Holy Spirit um, uh, speaking behind you. Uh, and we look forward to hearing what the Lord has placed on your heart this morning. So the way it's going to work today, uh, as normal, after our first song, Catherine is going to come to lead us in prayer. Then there'll be a set of worship songs, uh, and there will be an opportunity to give to the Lord's work at Mount Zion. The stewards will, will come amongst us and take up an offering. However, uh, as we say every week now, if you haven't come with, uh, laden with loose change, uh, as you leave this morning, you can easily use a bank card just to use the, uh, the card machine to make an offering electronically, if you wish. There's no obligation at all to do that, but it is available for us. After that time of worship, there'll be an opportunity for children and youth to go out to the junior church. Um, but um, before of all that, I've been asked to make two short announcements. Um, first, a message from Sandra Payne. Sandra says, I'm quoting, Ladies, next Wednesday, the 24th of November, a new Bible study based on the book of Acts called The Gospel on the Ground will start at 10.30 a.m. in the vestry here at Mount Zion. We will watch a video of uh, Christy McClellan teaching the Bible through its original historical, cultural, geographical, and linguistic context. Uh, Christy is an amazing teacher, and we will hear how the kingdom of God moved into a world of empire. There are seven sessions, three of which will be done by Christmas. The other four will be in the new year. Uh, you can contact Sandra Payne uh, or Rini Alsasa for further details. So that's something to put in your diaries, uh, and that starts uh, next Wednesday, the 24th. Um, the second announcement is about this year's Advent book copy of which I have here in my hand. So over the last few years, the church has provided an Advent book to each member of the fellowship uh, to help us walk together uh, through the Advent period and up to Christmas. 
These books have been distributed by hand, usually involving a lot of uh, driving around the streets and lanes of Ceredigion, Preseli, and Carmarthenshire uh, just before uh, the end of November. This year, we hope to reduce the amount of traveling by distributing the books at the church starting this morning. Uh, Advent starts next week, next Sunday. This year's Advent book is called The Radiant Dawn, uh, based on uh, Luke's chapters 1 and 2, and it has 25 daily Bible readings with a small commentary. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to follow together as a fellowship uh, through the Advent period with a, with a, with a short uh, reading there. So we have the books in, in church uh, for you to collect at the end of the service. Everybody is welcome to a copy. Um, Bronwen will probably come down to the back here, down to the front and organize that later. We'll ask you to sign a sheet to allow us to keep record of who's had a copy so that we don't, uh, you know, end up having to drive to your house and find you've already got one. Uh, so please feel free to come and take one, but sign the sheet. Great. That's enough from me. Um, I'm going to hand over to Steve and Vicky. Thank you. Am I on? I'm on. I'm on. So there might be a few of us this morning, but I've noticed all the best singers are still here, so that's good. We're going to stand now, we're going to sing Light of the World. We're going to just focus on Jesus and what he's done for us, what he's doing for us, and his great love. Oh, 
of interesting people to talk to and brothers and sisters in Christ visiting from all over the world. How fantastic. I have a confession to make. I have zero interest in any tournament that's going on at the moment. World Cup football, World Cup rugby, cricket, whatever. Zero interest in it. But I have a message from Qatar this morning that just makes my heart sing. And with your permission, I'm going to read it out to you. It's via Open Doors. Christians in Qatar are inviting the global church. That's us. To join with them in praying for a move of the Holy Spirit in the World Cup. Foreign Christians in the host nation can gather freely, although space is limited and there are some restrictions. However, Qatari believers, who are very small in number, are forbidden from having their own churches or even entering a church. Converts can face extreme pressure from their family and community. But, I love that, it's like a therefore in the Bible. But, despite the costs that can come with following Jesus, The church in Qatar is growing. And there is the expectation that it will continue to do so during the World Cup. Direct quotation now from a pastor in Qatar. We're expecting a big move of the Holy Spirit during the World Cup, says the leader of a church for migrant workers and foreign nationals. Our main focus in our prayers is that God will touch the nationals here. Wait for this bit. We have already seen the move of the Holy Spirit in Qatar. God is visiting people in dreams. God is doing miracles. God is doing healings amongst the Qatari people. I believe that we have a golden opportunity during the World Cup. I hope that the name of the Lord will be magnified during the event. Pray that all fear will vanish and that people will speak openly. We believe that miracles will happen. Isn't that a wonderful message from Qatar this morning? I don't care about the football. (laughs) So, as we come as the world church to pray. I'd like to read just one more little quotation that I've come across recently that has touched my heart. Prayer is not powerful because of who is praying, but because of who is listening. So let's come together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, the global church, part of the global church here at Mount Zion, cry out to you. And we are more than grateful that you are listening. Listening to us as a church, listening to us as individuals. And we come together to pray for Qatar to join with our brothers and sisters there, praying that the Holy Spirit will move mightily among people in Qatar during the World Cup. That all fear felt by Christians will vanish and that believers will express their faith with boldness and expectation and that the World Cup will lead to greater religious freedom 
for Qataris. And Heavenly Father, we are aware that your world can appear in turmoil and chaos. And we are so, so grateful that our hearts know that you are in control. And with that in mind, we pray for Ukraine and for other war-torn parts of the world that man's inhumanity to man will cease and your peace, your perfect peace, your shalom will descend. And we pray for the men's retreat going on at the moment. And we pray that Carwin and Ewan and Chris Frost will have their words anointed more than they could hope or think or pray. And that the men will hear your voice speaking to them and come back refreshed, renewed, revived and ready. And as we, Lord, come to this wonderful season of Advent, faith, hope, love and joy. Who wouldn't want that, Lord? Who would say no to faith, hope, love and joy? And so we pray your blessing upon these books here that each one of us, Lord, will experience a radiant dawn by joining together and being enlightened by your Holy Spirit. Lord, your word, using the message translation in 1 Corinthians, says, go after a life of love as if your life depended on it. Because it does. And so, we pray Paul's prayer to the Ephesians for each and every one of us here and for your global church. And Paul says, I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep, his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And now, Father, help us to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, Help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. And all God's people said, Amen. going to sing four songs now um, and God's given me um, these songs I believe he wants us to just they're more meditative than maybe normal so um, maybe God wants us to more meditate on him today and, and just look look to him yeah so please stand or sit or kneel you know wherever you feel comfortable we're just going to sing these songs together
God, Lord, that, that we're here even now, Lord, that you laid everything out for us, Lord. You gave up everything, Lord, for us. And we praise you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that we can know you. We can know you as our Savior and our God and our strong deliverer. And we praise you now, Lord. We just pray now for Dave, Lord, as he brings your word, Lord. Bless him, speak through him, and speak into our hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. How are we all? Yeah, I know I'm well and happy to be here today. Um, how, how strange it is how God works sometimes, um, even at the last minute. Um, when Catherine stood up here to pray, Charmaine and I had to have a little chuckle because I'd spent quite some time uh, quite fascinated about this situation in Qatar. And uh, we'd been looking at it and uh, saying, wow, there's a lot here to pray about. There's a lot to think about. There's a lot that would make us, yeah, just be thankful of what we have, where we are, and all of these things. And um, two o'clock this morning, God woke me up and changed and said, I have to say, we had thought a little bit about it last night. Charmaine has helped me a lot with this. And... Um, it got to a point where it became obvious that uh, we weren't totally comfortable. But then when God woke me up at two this morning and said, I want you to talk about something else. I want you to bring a different message. Um, it wasn't entirely different because we're going to be looking at uh, Matthew 26 from uh, 35 to 46, Gethsemane. A tough one. A tough one because I feel that uh, we are seeing Jesus here at the perhaps the toughest time in his ministry. But through this whole thing, what we will see is the fact that he is sovereign, is in control, and actually knew everything that was about to happen. Everything that was about to happen. Even the Holy Spirit coming, everything changing. So... Um, yeah, so I'd like to pray before we start. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to just look at your word together. We thank you that um, you bless us with your presence in this place, not just because we're gathered here together, but uh, also you live in each and every one of us, each of us who would look to you, who would turn to you, who would give our lives and our hearts to you. And Lord, we rely on you so much in every aspect. Again, as has been mentioned, we think of the guys this morning, particularly um, with you, Anne, and Chris, and Caroline, take, um, bringing your word on the retreat. And we ask that the blessing there is great. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I had a photo from uh, Mark this morning at uh, 7.30 showing me the blustery weather that they were having on the coast there. looked fantastic. I've... Uh, I'm missing it already. I've been on the last two retreats, but um, to be here today, yeah, very different. Not something that I've ever expected to do myself. You know, you know how it is. You, you, we all have a message in us, and I think at times we all seem to think, well, I've got something to say. What would I say if I was standing up the front here? And I've got so many different ideas, so many inspirations from what I'd heard from other people and what I'd read, but today... This is nothing that, that I expected. I mean, I'm an Old Testament guy, for goodness sake. I mean, I, I, like, I like the Old Testament, and I would be there in Genesis. I would be talking to you about that. But I think God's put on my heart today to speak from Matthew. So let me just read the uh, first part here, if I can. <clears throat> then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men watch for me for one hour, he asked Peter. 
Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed for the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. This is God's word. So there's a lot to look at in these verses. Um, Today, um, the one thing that has stood out for me it's, it's one short line of all of that, one short line. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Um, a, number, a number of us read our Bibles along with Matthew Henry and um, looking at what he has to say on this particular piece. He says, by affirming that the spirit is willing, Jesus was saying that he knew the disciples wanted to stay awake and to pray but the weakness of the flesh had overpowered the spiritual desire to pray and watch. Jesus was not scolding them, but exhorting them to be aware of the weakness of the flesh. The Lord was fighting for some, the same struggle against the flesh, but he had overcome it. As we have heard, the Son of Man was delivered into the hands of sinners, and uh, Jesus was taken, he was put on cr- trial, and he was crucified. We know there is much to say regarding the crucifixion and and all around that time. But today I'd like to move on to the time after Jesus was resurrected. After Jesus rose from the dead, he would spend the next 40 days among his disciples, encouraging them and explaining to them what their lives would look like, what they would look like when he returned to the Father, when they were left on their own. And on the 40th day, just before ascending to heaven, he told the disciples to return to Jerusalem, saying, wait for the promise of the Father until you are strengthened with my power on high, for you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes on you, and you shall be my witnesses. These words are found in Luke 24. The apostles returned to Jerusalem and uh, with well over 120 disciples and their women and children staying together all in the upper room and praying and waiting in obedience to Jesus, uh, to Jesus' last final command before his departure. Ten days later, an awesome manifestation of God's power occurred, a sound like the rushing of a mighty wind that filled the whole house and they were filled... They saw the appearance of many tongues of fire and rested on them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This was what Jesus had promised, the supernatural strength uh, from the Lord to enable them to continue his work after he had departed. Peter was changed from a man who denied Christ to a man whose entire heart and life transformed by the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, led the disciples in the greatest adventure of all times. There was a great religious festival going on in the streets of Jerusalem at that time, and visitors from many foreign nations had come from the annual celebration of the Jews' Feast of the Harvest. When Peter (coughs) stepped into the streets, with all those 120 disciples now filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. They all supernaturally began to speak in the language of the multitudes visiting from Jerusalem that day. Yet none... Yet none of the... Um, none of all of the crowds uh, about the wonderful... knew about the news of, um, of God's love in Jesus and his message of salvation. Then Peter began to take the message to large crowds. He spoke with such authority and conviction that incredibly 3,000 people were saved and committed themselves to serve the Lord as full-time disciples. Peter changed. 
Here was the man who had denied Christ and who had slept in the Garden of Gethsemane. But now he stood before thousands. He stood before thousands in the city where Jesus had been crucified. He would proclaim God's message to all. What caused this sudden transformation? The power and might of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had promised this. They had received power after the Holy Spirit had come upon them. Peter had gone through the most severe testings and trials of his life only a few short weeks before, but no longer did he remember the pain and the agony that he had felt. There was no time for remorse. <clears throat> An incredible time of witnessing and winning others into God's kingdom was underway, and the Lord was using him in ways that Peter had never dreamed would be possible. Previously, Peter had been impulsive, always seeming to say the wrong things at the wrong times, but now... He was spreading the word just as the Lord had prayed. <clears throat> At one point in Luke, uh, in chapter 22, uh, Jesus says to Simon, Satan has asked to sit, to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And it's as if at this early time, um, he would have known what was going to happen even to the point of after the crucifixion, the Holy Spirit had to be put on the disciples. They would have to be changed. And in the garden, we saw a time of weakness. We saw a time when there was no way they could stay awake, no way they could do anything but sleep. But now, all of a sudden, all this had changed. So Peter was on fire, and the disciples were overjoyed to see the Lord working so many miracles. Even though they had forsaken him in his most desperate hour, they knew that Jesus still loved them. And now they are experiencing a strength of faith that was greater than when Jesus had walked right among them. Why is it that when we stand up here, it gets so thirsty? <laughs> yeah. I was saying to a few of you a few moments ago, my resting heart rate is usually about 50-something, um, and uh, in here today I've been averaging 120, so uh, it's just, uh, it's just uh, yeah, and I don't think I'm kind of nervous or anything, it's just like, it's just how it takes you. So Peter was on fire, and the disciples were overjoyed to see the Lord working so many miracles. Even though they had forsaken him in his most desperate hour, they knew that Jesus still loved them, and now they were experiencing strength and faith greater than when Jesus had walked right among them. It seemed that Jesus was right there with them, but even closer, even closer than before. They remembered the words he'd spoken to them. It is necessary that I go away. For if I do not, the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, will not come. Right now the Spirit lives with you, but then he will be in you. And he believes, and that he believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than all of these shall you do, because I go to my Father. Shortly after this incredible day, where over 3,000 were saved, another occasion where a man who was lame from birth was instantly healed by Peter and John in front of many people. And when Peter spoke to the huge crowd that gathered to see the miracle, 5,000 more joined ranks with the disciples, increasing their number to over 8,000 men, not counting the women and children. These would be the greater works that Jesus had spoken of. Why? Because Jesus was no longer merely with them, but he was in them by way of the Holy Ghost. In the following days, Peter and John faced a wave of persecution from the religious leaders who had crucified Jesus but this time, there was no denial. Peter stood before the councils, testifying with such strength, with such authority of the Spirit. And the Bible says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and ignorant men, they marveled at them and knew that they had been with Jesus. Why did they marvel? Because they saw the same power in them that Jesus had walked in when he walked on earth. So, <clears throat> um, 
bringing it um, close to home, my personal experience is uh, just Friday morning, in fact. Um, I've been meeting here for some years now with uh, a number of guys. It varies sometimes as three or four of us, sometimes as many as eight of us. We meet at 7 a.m. in the back there, and we get together and we pray and we go for coffee afterwards. And uh, this Friday morning, one of the guys, I'm not going to mention any names um, just because he's American, but um, um, yeah, he, he, uh, he, he came up with this uh, thing. He said it's um, he, budget day, that's what he said. He says it's budget today, but we don't have to worry about that, do we? Because it's not going to affect us. It's not going to affect us at all, really. Uh, we'll just carry on and... Um, It'll be the same as it was yesterday. Things might be a bit more expensive. It doesn't affect us too much. And um, I agreed with him. I straight away just said, yeah, that's fine, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that one. And um, yeah, it was right. It wouldn't affect me too much. However, I had been very quick to think of myself and not to consider others because these times are hard for so many. We've all seen our fuel bills rise. We've all seen... The cost of food, so many things has uh, changed, has gone up, and, uh, and yet there was me very quick to think, well, you know, I'm okay, maybe because I don't have children to look after anymore, because I, you know, we only have the two of us to think about. It made me think uh, about Jesus. His thinking was so opposite to mine. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, how he didn't consider himself he thought only, only of the disciples, but us. He thought of what he would be doing for us. He'd known all along. He'd read at 12 years old, probably, the, the prediction, which I did write down here somewhere, uh, in Isaiah. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet he considered him punished by God stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his, by his wounds we are healed. We all know those words very well, but how hard is it for us to think, to think like that? Um, Jesus, as he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, was considering the plight, as I've said, of all of us when he accepted that cup. He prayed three times. And this is something I'd never noticed before until I started to look at this. I've heard it said that he asked three times for the cup to be taken away. And it might just be me who hadn't noticed, but uh, the second time he accepts his task. He says, if it is not possible... For this cup to be taken away unless I drink it may your will be done to be in that place where given something to do and we could have argued three times we could have said three times look um, I don't want to do this but he just said it the once and then he obeys what the father said if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it may your will be done Two generations ago, my grandparents, uh, two old, old names we don't hear anymore, Reginald and Blanche. Uh, Reginald and Blanche Lusher, they lived in a town of Stalham in Norfolk, which is where I grew up, where I went to school. Uh, they were married in the early 1930s. Granddad owned one of two bakeries in Stalham. Granted, was a hard-working guy. He would get up very early in the morning, light the ovens, bake the bread, and uh, cook cakes, and then he would get in his van and he'd deliver them all around Norfolk, all around the towns and villages there. That was, that was what he did. And Nan, she had the two children. Um, my uncle, uh, Gerald, he'll be 90 next month now. And, and mum, she's not much younger, but a little bit. And... Um, yeah, they um, brought them up as uh, Christians in a family. They went to the chapel I went to uh, when I was probably about six or seven years old. Uh, pretty much identical, just slightly larger than this. Uh, I'll never forget the first day when um, Fred Hoddinock brought me in that door and I looked in and just the flashback from when I was six years old, we would... Um, 
we would sit there for the first part and when they called the children through, it was just the same as it is now. I would go with the Sunday school teacher through the door there and learn about Samson and Delilah. And uh, so, gone a bit off piece there, sorry. Um, so, um, yeah, so getting back to Nan and Grandad, I mean, they were busy. They had busy lives. They were bringing up the children. They were running the bakery, as I've said. Nan, she had problems. Um, she had what we would call depression. She would say that she had a dread or that she was melancholy, which is a word we don't hear very much now. We can't compare my nan's sufferings to, to that of uh, Christ, but uh, this reminds me of the state. Um, the word melancholy reminds me of the state of Jesus in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane. The dictionary would tell us that um, Melancholy is beyond sad. It's a word for the gloomiest of spirits. Being melancholy means that you're overcome in sorrow, wrapped up in sorrowful thoughts. And when we think that, uh, yes, so much, so severe uh, would it be that Jesus would sweat drops of blood in that place. But um, so Nan, yeah, she struggled uh, in many ways. There were days when she couldn't, she was disabled by this whole situation. She couldn't do anything. She would just have to sit and she, she would say she would weep. And uh, I remember it well from, from my um, early days, from when I was 10, 12, 13, we lived very close to them and I remember her being like this. But a funny thing happened. This was early 1930s, so just before the Second World War. And with her in that state, you would think the outbreak of war would really sent her into a tailspin. The opposite seems to be the case here. And it makes me think again of how we are empowered when we have to do something, how the spirit comes over us, how we are changed and how we have to step up to the plate sometimes. Um, <clears throat> where they were on the east coast of England, Norfolk, they were about 40 air bases, airfields, as they were at the time. And being closest to Europe was prime places to be hit by the, uh, by the enemy. Heavy bombers and fighter aircraft would fly f from our airfields and uh, the enemy's planes would fly to locate the, and bombard those areas <coughs> in Norfolk, Suffolk, probably Essex and up into Lincolnshire. Um, Around 1944, the first unmanned rockets, I mean, these were early cruise missiles, they were used by the enemy, V-1 rockets that uh, were also known as doodlebugs. These things would fly from uh, the enemy air base and they would have a range of about 200 miles before they ran out of fuel and just dropped. And um, my Mum remembers quite clearly, she was saying to me the other day, that uh, they would hear what sounded like a pack of motorcycles coming down the street, and uh, then all of a sudden there'd be silence, and they would count to nine, and then there would be a bang. I mentioned there were two bakeries in the town. <coughs> Um, one owned by um, my parents and the other by another family. Um, on one particular day, my nan and my mum were in the baker's van. They'd been doing some deliveries and they were in the main street in Stalham. And uh, one of these doodle bugs hit the second bakery, not the one owned by my grandparents, but the other one, and um, destroyed it completely, killing the baker and his daughter. The shrapnel and debris from this uh, explosion penetrated the side of the van. Fortunately, um, my nan and my mum were fine. They were, <clears throat> they were unharmed and nan carried on her role to run tea rooms, take out deliveries and look after the children. This would be probably the best time in nan's life. A time when all around in chaos, God can use us and give us supernatural strength um, along with the will to follow his direction. Her obedience to what God wanted, her acceptance of the spirit at that time gave her the power to be able to work and to help people and to do what was required of them. 
It seems that sometimes God uses and empowers us with the Holy Spirit for the tasks that we, in our own power, would be unable to do. So, Father, we thank you. As, um, as I end this message, I thank you that um, we are given that power, we are given that strength, we are given the ability to do things beyond. But give us, we pray, the willingness and the heart for people, for others, for our neighbours, for those less fortunate, for those unable to be able to achieve what we can achieve, what we can achieve. We, you bless us, Lord, with many things and help us to know when we've been blessed that we might share with others, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Dave, for that word. I'm going to finish now with a song which is very fitting to what Dave's just spoken about. Stand and sing this together.
Many thanks, Dave, for the message this morning. Um, I was reading, uh, doing a Bible study this morning, and uh, one of the questions that that, that asked is, you know, to think about um, Jesus and uh, his emotional response to things. And there were some verses in that passage which were really powerful about the sorrow that the Lord felt. So that really resonated with, uh, with me this morning. So thank you very much for that and your willingness to, 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 to come forward and to, to share that with us. And I never knew that about your grandparents. It's a lovely story. Thank you. Thank you to Catherine for a prayer, Steve and Vicky for leading us in worship. Um, as we close, don't forget to, uh, to see Bronwyn before you leave this morning to collect your personal copy of um, this year's Advent book um, and um, hope you um, get great benefit uh, from that. Coffee and tea are available um, and it'll be brought out uh, on trays to remain here, uh, or sorry, so you can remain here but there are some tables in the vestry as normal for those who prefer to sit and share fellowship uh, as well around the, uh, around the table. Um, so as we close, let's um, share the blessing together and let's look up and, uh, uh, and look around us as we say the words of the blessing to each other, which uh, I always uh, think is a, is a lovely thing to do at the end of a service. So, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.